Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your Creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 388 for the 21st of Kislev in Alipir. So if you listened to yesterday's episode of this podcast, you might have been left with feeling somewhat unresolved, which would make sense because we were kind of left hanging on a question mark yesterday. The question mark was in terms of what is the point of this book? Why did the Alter Rebbe put this book into writing? So yesterday we, we began the Alter Rebbe's forward to the book. And in this forward to the book, from what we learned yesterday, rather than trying to convince us all as to why it's a really good idea for him to write this book, it seems like he's kind of playing devil's advocate somewhat. Like yesterday, we really explored several challenges, several concerns that the Alter Rebbe had with when people look at the written word versus uh, a live teacher, the difference between those two things and how the written word really cannot take the place of a live teacher. Uh, He presented the various limitations to the written word and he kind of put these limitations into two categories. Category number one is the limitation of the human mind, such that if you have two people, let's say, who are learning the same thing, their intellects, due to their intellects, due to their uh, sophistication, due to to their um, mental clarity and all kinds of different things, all kinds of different factors, they're going to get different things out of the book. And if somebody has a very confused mind, then even if the book itself is a very wise book, just by reading the book without the help of a teacher, without a teacher actually there mentoring them in real life, uh, this might present some problems, some issues in having them gain the full uh, benefit of whatever it is that they're learning. Uh, limitation number two that the ultra Rebbe brought up is with the contents that's being learned itself. That like when you like narrow down knowledge into one book, whether it's a, a book that was written by very wise scholars, or even if it's a book that's really compiled from Torah true teachings, such as the Tanya is in this case, it's still like not necessarily going to be relevant in the same way to every single person because we're all different. We all have different personalities. And in fact, we actually all have different sources of our soul, which so, which shows us that even when it comes to something like Torah, which is relevant to all souls and which, which unites all of us as Jews to God, nevertheless, even within the Torah, there's some parts of Torah that are more relevant to some people and some parts of Torah that are less relevant to some people. So Torah, connecting to God, serving God, being close to God is not a one size fits all, fit, fits all situation. Yes, we all have the same laws. We all have the same Torah teachings and all of that. But nevertheless, it is a very individualistic experience or it should be anyways. So in that case, how could the Alter Rebbe justify giving out this book and compiling this book, this book of the Tanya that we're going to be learning? So that's the answer that we're going to come to today. This is where this is where we come to the answer part, the second part of the forward where the Alter Rebbe addresses these concerns. And while he doesn't dismiss these concerns, he addresses them and he explains why nevertheless, uh, this safer, um, he decided to put together this safer and why it is an important safer uh, to, to study and why people need not be that concerned with those previously mentioned concerns in yesterday's episode. So he starts off today and he says that first of all, he wants to point out his audience. He wants to be clear about who his audience is. So just like, you know, anytime you market uh, any kind of product, the first question that the marketing company will ask you is who's your audience? You know, you want to write a book, who's your audience? Are you writing to mothers? Are you writing to children? Are you writing to businessman, like what is, what's your audience here? So the ultra Rebbe here tells us who his audience is. He says his audience is his chassadim, it's his followers. Who are his followers? These were people who used to approach the ultra Rebbe 
very regularly for spiritual guidance, for spiritual advice. So these were people who the Ultra Rebbe knew very intimately. They would speak to him about all kinds of different things that were going on in terms of their service of God, very emotionally uh, rent issues and things like that. So what the Ultra Rebbe is coming to tell us here is that he's not just writing this book in this like from like an IV tower kind of thing, but he's writing this book with very specific people in mind, with a very deep, intimate knowledge of, of uh, the people that he knows that are in mind. So yesterday we spoke about this idea of like learning exercise classes off of YouTube and stuff like that. So while those kind of things can be uh, beneficial in a certain sense, the person that is teaching the class on YouTube most likely never met you, most likely doesn't know anything about you, and is kind of just putting this class together for a bunch of random people that you may or may not fit into that category versus how different would it be if you actually had a teacher who knew you intimately and then for whatever reason couldn't be with you and at that point then they made a, a video tailor made to you so i actually have had this situation in my business before like with uh, as i've mentioned on uh, previous episodes that uh that my day job <laughs> is that i actually match up fitness instructors with clients and clients with fitness instructors so i send out fitness instructors to work with clients and i've actually had situations where there'll be a trainer who goes to train a client in their home and they go there week after week after week for a bunch of months, let's say. And then there's a time when the trainer goes on vacation. And some of my trainers who have done this and who feel this sense of loyalty and dedication to their clients, they've actually put together a video for the client to watch uh, while they're away. So this is different than a YouTube video, right? Because um, this is not just some random person that they're watching on the screen. This is a teacher who knows them, knows their ins and outs, knows the mistakes they tend to make. They're they're various misalignments and all of that. And obviously it's not the same thing as being in the room with, with the student, but nevertheless, there is a difference when this teaching, this virtual teaching we can say is coming from a teacher who really knows you versus a teacher that has never met you ever in your life and doesn't really know anything about you. And it's just kind of sharing these general ideas. So this is what the ultra up is trying to give over in this in, in this part of the Ford is he's trying to tell us that, you know, one way to think of this book and how you can kind of think of it as being different than some other books that are out there that contain that might contain guidance and things like this is he's writing it for a very specific audience and he knows this audience and he knows this audience deep deeply and very intimately because this audience these are people who have come to him time and time again with their most intimate problems in terms of uh, their service of God their spiritual endeavors their existential questions about life and all of those kind of things so he's he's giving them uh, answers he's he's speaking to them in a way that is really relevant to them so you may sit, be saying to yourself okay that's all well and good for the chassidim of the ultra rabbi but what where does that put me why should i read this book so on a deeper level we can know that um according to chassidus when we have a rebbe when there's there's different rabbim um throughout history the seventh labavitcher rabbi being like the final iteration of this rebbe uh, dynasty, at least in terms of Lubavitch, these Rebbeim are not not like regular people. Their, their, their souls are thought of to be these collective souls that contain within them a connection to all Jewish souls, or at least, or maybe most especially, we can say to those people who choose to follow them. So meaning if you decide to read this book, it might sound like kind of like a catch 22, but like by virtue of you deciding to read this book, and if you decide to study this book with sincerity, and, uh, and really look to it for guidance, you then become a follower of the Alter Rebbe, and you fall into that category. And even if he never actually met you in real life, his soul is connected to you in such a way that there is this intimate connection to you. And thus, even if you weren't one of the actual, you know, Hasidim that lived at that time in a physical sense, you kind of are still kind of in that category. And thus, anything that the Alter Rebbe is going to be teaching in the Tanya, he had you in mind on some spiritual level as well. Now, the next part that the Alter Rebbe wants to uh, address here in the forward is he wants to reiterate this idea of uh, this, his sources. He wants, wants to reiterate his source work and he wants to reiterate the thing, the idea that he's not authoring these things, these these uh, teachings that that he's going to be um, giving over in this Sefer, but rather, once again, it's a compilation. It's a liquite amarim. It's a compilation of teachings. And wh what are his sources for this material? So once again, just like he mentioned in the uh, in the Shar, in the... Um, 
cover page of the Safer, uh, they're coming from books and from teachers. What are the books? Like we mentioned back then in the first episode, the books are mainly the Shla, the Maharal, and the Rambam. Rambam. Uh, those are the main sources of Hasidic uh, literature, and obviously, you know, there's the Gemara and um, and the and the Chumash and and all of that also is like kind of primary source, and then uh, also from very holy people. So, who are these very holy people who passed away? This is uh, he's this is a direct reference to the Baal Shem Tov and to the Magid of Mazrach, who were his two primary teachers. And then the Ultra Rebbe makes a reference to his other teachers, you know, more. Um, kind of other mentors that he had uh, who were also students of the Magid, that it, many of the students of the Magid, who is like the Ultra Rebbe's Rebbe, the Ultra Rebbe's like main, main uh, teacher, but the, many of the Magid students, the Ultra Rebbe also considered to be his mentors. And many of those people ended up moving to the land of Israel, but they wrote many letters. Uh, most prominent amongst these figures was a uh, rabbi named Rabbi Menachem Mandel Vitebsk. And he did end up moving to the land of Israel. And so the Ultra Rabbi says that these uh, many of these teachings that he's going to be uh, writing about in these and bringing down in this Sefer Tanya are things that also come up and are alluded to in letters from these teachers. And also that some of them, the Ultra Rabbi heard face to face from these teachers before they ended up moving to the land of Israel. And so now what are we to expect out of this book? So the Ultra Rabbi told us the the challenges of of presenting this book then he told us who his uh his uh, intended audience is for this book and now he's going to tell us what we should expect out of the book so what should we expect out of this book so the ultra Rebbe says that basically this is we can be thought of as a sort of spiritual faq spiritual frequently asked questions uh, so he started to notice in um in his leadership that his followers would come to him with different questions and many of the questions were recurring there were a lot of different questions that came up that you know yes obviously people are individuals and every situation is slightly different and all of that but there was a lot there were a lot of recurring themes so that so that's sort of like part of the idea of this book is the, this idea this the idea of this book is like to take all of these like recurring themes that people um, brought up and and put them together in a book and say like okay you have this question guess what many other people have this question too and so here's the answer for that so on a pragmatic level part of the reason for this book was really just due to time constraints as the ultra Rebus followers got bigger then this became more necessary and as we know eventually when the ultra rabbi passed away we don't have the ultra rabbi here anymore to ask him face to face these questions so this is kind of like just a pragmatic way that we can access the teachings of the ultra rabbi and these frequently asked questions um, in a much more accessible way. The other reason why this can be beneficial, having this written format of these frequently asked questions is because is due to forgetfulness. So do you ever have a situation where you go to ask somebody for advice and you forget to bring your pen and paper with you and the person gives you really good advice and it sounds really amazing at the time and then you leave and you're at, you tell your friend about it and your friend says, oh wow, that's you sound really inspired. What did this person tell you? And then do you ever have the experience of, oh my gosh, I don't actually remember word for word what they said, or I kind of remember this, I kind of remember that, I don't remember the full detail, you know, like this is kind of like the idea of a broken telephone, right? Like it's it's hard to remember every single detail that uh, that somebody tells you, and it's, it's only human nature to forget. Um, so having these teachings in a written format is a way to prevent that, is a way to alleviate that, because we can always reference the book and we can look right in the Tanya and see, okay, this is clearly pen and paper, this is what the Alter Rebbe taught us. And so the purpose of the Sefer is to serve as a sign so that people won't need to have a private audience as often. And this the Sefer is meant to serve as sort of like a sedative for the soul to ease our souls uh, so that if anytime people are feeling a sense of difficulty and struggle in terms of their service of God, they can reference this book and, and hopefully their their heart and their soul can come to a place of feeling really secure and at ease with God. Or in the altar of his own words in the Hebrew, he says, that his heart will trust in God. So this word batuach, that's related to the word bitachon in Hebrew. And this is this could be a whole discussion in its own right, but like what's the difference between emuna, faith, and bitachon, trust. So emuna is something that we were all born with. There's actually a discussion within Hasidus about like is, and actually within Jewish 
Jewish literature in general is emuna having faith in God, believing in the existence of God. Is that a mitzvah or is it not a mitzvah? And we find that some uh, some skull sages did count it amongst being one of the mitzvahs and some did not. So there's a whole discussion about this idea. Within Hasidus, uh, the Tzavach Tzedek talks about this a lot. There's sort of like this idea that to actually just believe in, in the existence of God is not a mitzvah because it's something that all of us do all Jews believe in God, regardless of whether we're conscious of that belief or not. It's something that we inherited from our forefathers. We all have this essential belief that God exists. But what we don't necessarily have, and what is something that we need to work on, is bitachon. Bitachon is trust. So it's one thing to believe. So it's like, let's say you have a, a parent or a friend or a spouse that you believe in. You believe that they have the best interest in mind for you, but do you trust them? Do you really put your full trust in them that if they're going to take care of something, you know that they're going to have your back and you don't you can be at ease and you can just calm down and relax because you know that they're taking care of whatever it is they need to take care of that's what having bitachon in hashem is it's not just believing that god exists and that in theory god wants to wants the best for you but you truly trust that he is navigating your life and bringing everything in your life in a way that is truly good for you. So this is what the altar of it was hoping that this Tanya Safer would bring to to his followers is this peace of mind, this state of calmness that comes from having bitachon and Hashem to bring them to really trust in God. So all of this up until now and in this, what we've learned today of this part of the forward sort of addresses the question as to how it is that one book can be relevant to all people. Because we spoke about how, uh, you know, even when we say uh, uh, teachings that are based on the Torah, which we know theoretically are really relevant to all people, everybody has a different soul root. So here the Ultra Rebbe seems to be implying that, that while that might be true, who the, the people that he's addressing this specific safer to, which are his followers, are people that he actually knows them. He knows them intimately. He knows what they need. And that's that's who the book is tailor-made to. Now, the altar rabbi is going to respond to the first question that came up yesterday, which is this idea of what about if somebody's mind is limited? What if it's themselves that are holding them back? So it's like, let's say you have a safer, you have a book, you have a teaching, and the, there's nothing wrong with the teaching. The teaching is a very wise teaching, but your mind mind is limited. Uh, it's you, you don't have the intellectual capacity for whatever reason to really understand these things properly. What should you do in that case? So let's say if somebody wants to learn the Tanya and they're convinced, yes, this is a holy safer, it's probably going to be relevant to my life, but then they start learning it. And some of these ideas are really quite complex and really difficult to understand, especially when we get to the later parts of the Tanya. Those of you who have been following me and saw how I had, to, I was struggling even in those later sections of the Kuntras Ahran and the Yerat HaKodesh, it, even some of the earlier parts of the Tanya get quite complex and quite abstract. So what should such a person do? do. So the altar rabbi gives very practical advice. He says, in that case, then a person should not rely on the written text. And in, in that case, then a person should actually go to one of the great scholars in their town. And this scholar will enlighten them, will, will help them. And then the altar rabbi makes a note to these scholars. And he says, make sure that you, that you uh, oblige them, that you do help out these people that come in and seek your counsel. And don't have false modesty. Like, don't be one of those scholars that's like that says like, oh, no, 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 I, I don't know enough. I don't know enough. He says these kind of people who hold back knowledge when um, when they really do know, he says these. this is likened to somebody holding back food if they have food, which is an allusion to a verse in, uh, in Mishle, uh, chapter 11, verse 26, where it says, Ki which means he who keeps back grain, the nation will curse him, but a blessing will be bestowed on the head of he, him who sells grain. So meaning, you know, if, the simple meaning is that if, if people are in need of food and you hold back food, then that person that holds back the food will be cursed and the person who gives the food will be blessed. And in the Gemara in Sanhedrin page 91b, then the this the explanation for this is that this is a reference to Torah scholars, to people who know Torah, but they don't teach Torah. They're likened to somebody who uh, who's holding back food in this instance. 
And just as such a person who withholds food, uh, whether we're talking about physical food or the food of Torah, is punished, so too, uh, by, the, by contrast, is somebody who gives the food actually rewarded. And not only is he rewarded, but the person that he's giving this knowledge to is rewarded as well. And this is alluded to uh, once again in Mishli chapter 29, verse 13, where it says, Rash ve'ish techachim nifgashu me'ir eneish nehem Hashem. A poor man and a man of deep thought were visited upon, the Lord enlightened the eyes of both of them. So meaning to say very simply that if a person has Torah to teach, has wisdom to give over, and they give it over to a person in need, then the I, the the, the pauper benefits, like the person that's receiving the knowledge benefits, and the person who is giving over the knowledge benefits as well. And the altar Rabbi says that in such an instance, then Hashem will cause God's face to shine on both of them. And then the altar of it brings in a little bracha here um, that is based on two psukim, one from Yermiyahu and one from Yeshayahu, both of which allude to a time in the future when we won't need to have this teacher-student relationship in the same way because everybody will know God and the whole world will be filled with the knowledge of God, like water co covers the sea. And, Amen, says the altar of a Kenya Yeratsun, may be the will of God. Okay, so that, that sort of concludes the section of t for today where the altar addresses these concerns, these challenges that he brought up yesterday. And now in conclusion to this forward, the altar actually brings up um, several of the issues which were brought up by the in the approbations to the Sefer, which we learned in the first episode of this podcast which focused on the need for this publication to to be in existence due to the fact that were there were many of these teachings that were already distributed amongst the followers of the Alter Rebbe, but unfortunately, there were a lot of errors in them. Some of these errors were unintentional. Some of them, unfortunately, were intentional. And so thus, uh, this is why, says the Alter Rebbe, um, Rev Shalom Shachna and Rev Mordechai, who were the publishers of the Tanya, they decided to actually make this make this effort to to put this Tanya into print, so that there's now a legit uh, safer that contains these teachings, and it's been like looked over by the Alter Rebbe, and we know that they don't have there's no errors in them. Um, there's they've been thoroughly thoroughly checked, so we can rely on this safer as this is the authentic, this is the real stuff. And, uh, and the Ultra Rebbe congratulates them on doing this. He says this is a great thing that they're doing. And he says, uh, but on the other hand, there's a, he gives a warning um, against anybody going out and reprinting these uh, this this safer reprinting these words without the exp expressed permission of the publishers for the next five years. And this warning the Ultra Rebbe gives over in, in quite harsh language cited from Devarim chapter 27 verse 17 which is a curse actually where it says Arul, masig cursed be he who enroaches on his fellow's borders so meaning to say that like don't uh, print don't reprint things illegally you need to get permission in order to reprint the safer and that this directive is in place for the next five years since the writing of this and then he ends off and he says that may it be pleasant for those who comply with this. And this is the end. This is the conclusion of the forward of the Alter Rebbe, the forward of the compiler of Likutei Amarim. So that's it for today. So we got through the forward. We got through the title page. We got through the approbations. And we got through the forward. And tomorrow, very exciting, we're actually going to get into the meat of the Tanya. So stay tuned and I will speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Abraham Yitzhak ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Top project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.